Today's commencement speaker spent many years watching these proceedings at Shatter State College, both as a dean and as a vice president of academic affairs. Lois Veith Podobnik served CSC for nearly 35 years. She was a champion for science education on campus across Nebraska and in the region, writing or co-writing millions of dollars in grants in her time for teacher training and equipment. Lois was a recipient of the Nebraska State College System Teaching Excellence Award and the University of Wyoming College of Education Distinguished Alum Award. As the Vice President of Academic Affairs, Lois was instrumental in the design and implementation of the Essential Studies Program to replace the General Studies Program, and she helped establish an information commons in the King Library. She also developed faculty learning communities to plan and establish te the Teaching and Learning Center to assist faculty with innovative teaching methods. Spending time with family has been one of the main benefits of retirement for Lois. Her three children include Gisla, who is married to Tim Dolan. They live in Omaha with their daughter, Amelia. Lois' son, Logan, and his wife, Claire, live in Elkhorn, Iowa, with their sons, Warren and Calvin. Blake and his wife, Angela, live in Leesburg, Virginia, with their children, Cora and David Veith, and Ethan Henderson. Due to illness, Lois' husband, Don, is unable to attend, but wanted to be here very much today. He is a retired metallurgical engineer who spent more than 35 years overseas with mining operations for copper, molybdenum, and gold. He has three adult children. I am proud to invite Dr. Lois Veith, as I know her, to the podium. Thank you, Lois. Lois. Holy cow, this is a hard act to follow. <laughs> um, thank you, Dr. Ryan, and thank you, graduates, for the privilege of being part of this very special day for you and your families. Don't your hearts just swell with pride when you look down at this wonderful group of young people? This is how we make America great again. Our future is in your hands. When I was your age, if someone had told me all the things that were going to happen in my life, I never would have believed it. What I thought was the grand plan for my life turned out to be an ever-changing road map rather than a smooth, straight highway into the future. It turned out to be a broken road of sorts with starts and stops, some dead ends, as well as some spontaneous twists and turns. Not broken in the sense of no good, but just a little crooked on occasion. So instead of regaling you with some profound inspirational quotes, I thought I would share some stories from my broken road that may give you some comfort and perspective on yours. Here I am at 70 years old, and I still can't believe it, looking back on my life like some cosmic novel. I'm amazed, proud, a little embarrassed, occasionally bewildered, but most of all, joyful and grateful for all the things that have happened, and especially for my wonderful children and their families, and my two husbands, David and now Don, who unfortunately was too ill to travel here today. Frankly, the peak moments I thought were peak at the time turned out to be just another day as my assessment of values and life's treasures formed by years of living have redefined the meaning of peak for me. It's God's way of going, booga booga. <laughs> I, I understand there's a video game now that has this, but back in the day, 
That was a term I used to exclaim with great glee whenever I wanted to surprise one of my babies. It's a term that we started to use a lot in our family whenever we were surprised, either in a good way or a bad way, about how something turned out. A big booga booga in my life is that a lot of the decisions that I made on the spur of the moment without much thought, turned out to be pivotal, the real game changers. And I realized that at the time, I would have spent more time figuring things out. What I thought were the big decisions that I overprocessed and overanalyzed, in most cases, turned out to be pretty minor in terms of defining the broken road that led me here. Looking back on those decisions, I often say, when referring to the less than stellar ones, it seemed like a good idea at the time, and it probably involved a lot of beer. <laughs> For example, after I graduated with my first degree in chemistry, my late husband David Beeth and I were headed to San Diego for David to attend law school. He had been accepted at Cal Berkeley and at California Western in San Diego. The decision really came down to going to a much more prestigious institution in the Bay Area of San Francisco, think cold, windy, and Alcatraz, or to a small, relatively unknown law school in San Diego, spending all our spare time at the beach. Of course, the beach won. He was also accepted into medical school the year before, but an arrest on the beach during spring break, a clear case of police harassment, changed everything, and he became enamored with criminal defense. <laughs> but that's another story, and if you buy me a beer, I'll tell it to you. <laughs> so off we went with our newly minted degrees to San Diego in August. Why is this? Okay. All right, uh, I, have, I have Bluetooth hearing aids in because I'm 70. Maybe they were interfering with that. There we go. <laughs> Sorry. So we headed off to San Diego in August of 1969. In May, June, and July, I followed all the rules, wrote a stunning resume, puffed up my part-time college jobs, and sent personalized cover letters to every science employer I could find in the phone book in San Diego. Oh yeah, yeah. No, no indeed.com, no monster.com, no dot com, okay? The result was nothing, nada, not even a bite. So the week before law school classes started, we lowered, loaded all our worldly belongings into an open bat flatbed trailer pulled by David's best friend in the world, Johnny Milligan the plumber. Of course, they were loading things into the trailer as I filled boxes with clothes, dishes, random knickknacks in order to make a path to the furniture. They finished things up by moving our big heavy furniture and a bunch of college textbooks in last as behind the axle of the trailer. Yeah, <laughs> moving tip. The heavy things should always go in the front of the trailer, in front of the axle, or at the very least, over the axle. We ended up limping 100 miles south, doing no more than 32 miles per hour, trying to keep the trailer from fishtailing down the road and swaying the back of Johnny's truck all over the road. At midnight, we finally made it to Ocean Beach and unloaded our belongings and our dreams. Standing in front of a small four apartment building, nearly penniless, with no job, and David starting private, as in very expensive law school on Monday. The next morning, the manager came by to welcome us, a sweet, cheery young lady who asked me if I had a job yet. I was worried that she wanted the rent. She asked for my resume because her boss, Dr. John O'Brien, at the University of California, San Diego Medical School, was looking for someone with a degree in chemistry or physics for his research team. 
He wanted a blank slate person with good problem-solving skills who was meticulous so he could train them in the newly emerging field of tissue culture. 24 hours later, I had an interview and a job and a loan from the university credit union on my first month's pay <laughs> because I needed food and gasoline. I often wonder what would have happened if we'd rented a different apartment, where the broken road might have led us. Booga booga. By the way, the job in the Department of Neurosciences turned out to be a groundbreaking one. This was back in the 60s when no one understood what was causing a bunch of syndromes of the central nervous system in children. No bacteria, no viruses, no contagions, no environmental factors, just horrible terminal diseases that seemed to run in families. Then our research team discovered a missing enzyme in the tissue of victims, little molecules that make chemicals in our uh, make reactions in our brain go faster. When these are missing, they create a bottleneck where fatty deposits build up in our brain. This was the first time that enzymes had been conducted, connected to disease states in the human body. It also led to a brand new field of genetic counseling that had not existed before. As the enzyme levels were governed by genes inherited from the parents. Our pioneering work started with Tay-Sachs disease and later a whole host of others. We perfected the techniques of enzyme assays and I also worked on developing the ability to grow amniotic fluid cells to do amniocentesis for couples who had lost children to these devastating diseases. If you had told me then that you could buy a $99 kit from Ancestry.com 50 years later to analyze your genes, I would have been absolutely astounded. And I also probably would have asked, what's dot com? <laughs> booga booga. Another thing that was pretty amazing and later on related to my degrees and my career happened to me in the sixth grade. Sputnik had just been launched the year before in 1957. Okay, for you science phobes, Sputnik was the first human-made satellite ever in the history of the world. Think cell phones, Bluetooth, news, weather, sports, and movie on demand, just to name a few. Oh, and if someone had also told me I would later have a son who received a master's degree in space systems operations, I would have been amazed. But then I was only 10. The federal government was terrified of the huge lead the Soviets had in the space race, so they proceeded to test all of us in the sixth grade for IQ, math ability, and mechanical aptitude. When the school counselor called me in to review my results, she said, your scores are all off the charts. Uh, the top of the chart, okay? You know, there's, there's two ends of the chart, yeah. Uh, Usually students with these kinds of aptitudes go to engineering school, but only boys are allowed to do that. We, we actually talked like that in the 50s. It was, it was a June Cleaver, Betty Crocker moment. So I left her office thinking, well, okay then, I'll be a teacher. I had always enjoyed playing school with the neighborhood kids, and I really loved the idea of teaching anyway. Of course, my gender did not stop them from tracking my classmates and me into advanced math and science courses, and I found that I loved them. Turns out the little girl who wasn't allowed to go to engineering school was accepted with honors at entrance to the UCLA College of Engineering, but opted for a small new campus of the University of California at Riverside, where she ended up in chemistry. Another random decision made to escape living at home with my parents in Los Angeles. Booga booga. I received my first degree thinking I was going into teaching until that fateful day in front of the apartment building in San Diego. But law school finished and 10 years later, a different siren was calling us down the broken road. Teaching had always been in my heart and not just because I was a girl. The next chapter in my book of life brought us to a place called Shadron. But once again, it wasn't a pre-planned choice, but a series of small, individual decisions that collectively made all the difference. 
It was late in 1978 on a Friday afternoon at the medical school in San Diego, and I was quickly finishing up the feeding of my tissue cultures, hoping to beat the freeway gridlock for the long, slow, scorching commute home. But that didn't happen. As brakes screeched, horns honked, and fender betters built up over all the lanes, the electricity went out all over town. Now, you wouldn't think that would make much difference for a commute. But don't underestimate the inability of people to take turns at major intersections where eight lanes of traffic all converge into a single dark traffic light. Exhausted and fed up, I pulled into our driveway and proceeded to tell David that our life was insane. I was driving for hours back and forth each day in order to afford a little piece of paradise in the burbs, hoping that if I was sitting under a huge concrete overpass in snarled traffic, that the big one didn't decide to strike right then. Once again, with the help of a lot of beer, we decided it was time to leave the Southern California dream of sun and sand and head back to our roots, someplace west of the Mississippi to keep humidity down and north to cooler climes. We looked at all kinds of maps, and on one US map, found a place right smack dab in the middle, Broken Bow, Nebraska. What a great name, oh, especially for a couple of young history buffs and a young man who had spent his youth in infatuated with making rawhide pouches and dreaming of the adventures of Crazy Horse. Random calls to area judges and a local attorney who had just returned home to Broken Bow from a hunting trip in the Pine Ridge pointed to a little town named Shadron and an attorney, Duke Fisher, who was looking for a young associate. If we had chosen a different map, a different person to call, who knows where we might have landed. But after finding this paradise on the plains, we once again packed up all our worldly belongings and drove over icy roads in a black Cadillac convertible and a GT Fastback Mustang in what turned out to be one of the worst winters in Nebraska history. Booga booga. Record snowfalls made traveling down 385 like going through a snow tunnel with plowed berms higher than the truck. Yep, we got smart, we bought a truck, a nifty blue and white 70s Chevy four-wheeler, affectionately called the Ranch Wreck, that still resides on my son and daughter-in-law's farm in Iowa. Because we had no relatives, dear Shadron, we came from California, and David was a criminal defense attorney Everyone thought we were in the witness protection program and that David was an attorney for the mafia turned state's evidence. People believed that until the day he died. They actually wanted the true story at his funeral. You just gotta love small towns. I, I guess no one could believe that we left San Diego for Shadron because we loved it here. Booga booga. Another baby later, our little Husker, a medical illness by one of the science professors, and a call for an adjunct in chemistry, and then a physics opening at Shadron State changed everything. 18 months of commuting to graduate school at the University of Wyoming, and the little girl with dreams of Sputnik and space travel had her newly minted PhD in a tenure-track job at Shadron State. The choice of graduate school at the University of Wyoming wasn't because it was what I always wanted, but the broken road said it was close enough for commuting in the era before the internet and online courses. And so, booga booga, new wonderful mentors like Dr. Joe Steppens lit a fire inside of me and my passion for teaching using hands-on discovery techniques grew. None of my faculty colleagues were safe from my excited debates made over coffee in our conference room, talking about active, student-centered learning instead of lectures. I had swapped the nurturing of tissue cultures into the privilege of nurturing young lives. 
in sharing pioneering teaching techniques at the National Science Teachers Conventions and making the science of the universe accessible to students through the magic of planetarium shows. It was the best booga booga ever in my entire life. I finally found what I had always been meant to do, teach. Such a wonderful privilege to interact with and help young people like you, who are the greatest resource of our country and our future. It just doesn't get any better. What seemed like random choices made for a variety of reasons gradually charted my broken road, and my life unfolded, not through some intricate planning on my part, but just the cosmic twists and turns that God laid before me. I don't know what life has in store for you, nor how much or how little you will get. But I do know two things about you. You've made some great choices already. For whatever reasons, you've come to Shadron State College and you've completed your degree. You also have a great head on your shoulders as you have been mentored by some of the world's best professors sitting right here. Men and women who will never forget you, will look forward to hearing from you on your travels, and will always be there to give timely advice or commiserate over a beer. Give them another hand. Yes, your cosmic road has led you to this mo moment. You may get lost a time or two, but all those unrelated choices will be like northern stars pointing you down your broken road. And in the end, that will make all the difference. You may be feeling a little shaky right now about the road ahead, or maybe not even having a real plan, but it's all going to be OK. Your success is just one misstep on that broken road. And life unfolds as it should, whether we get it or not. So trust yourself, and most of all, enjoy this great road trip. And as the refrain from Rascal Flats and Robson and Steele says, I hope your days come easy and your moments pass slow. And each road leads you where you want to go. And if you're faced with a choice and have to choose, I hope you choose the one that means the most to you. And if one door opens to another door closed, I hope you keep on walking till you find the window. I hope you never look back, but you never forget all the ones who love you in the place you left. I hope you always forgive and you never regret and you help somebody every chance you get. I hope you find God's grace in every mistake and you always give back more than you take. My wish for you is that this life becomes all that you want, that your dreams stay big and your worries stay small, that you never need to carry more than you can haul. And while you're out there getting where you're getting to, I hope you know somebody loves you and wants those same things for you, too. Now may God, Wakantanka, Jehovah, Allah, Yahweh, the Great Attractor, or Lady Luck, bless you all on life's road. It's been a real privilege all these years. Thank you very much, and go Eagles!